not so much magical realism as magic mushroom realism, <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and I can confidently assert that that was a world premiere. Yes, it was indeed, yeah. Um, <laughs> elsewhere, you obviously had lots of fun writing that, Roddy. I, I, did, I gave yeah. up trying to find out how many nesting elsewheres there were in that story, because there's I just layers know. and layers of reality there, no, aren't I, there? I did, I did enjoy writing it, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about the, the San Patricios. I know very little about them. I didn't, I didn't really... Uh, it was just the sheer the romantic notion, that, that sentimentality. Again, I don't know if there's an equivalent here in Scotland. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there's an equivalent everywhere. This notion that, you know, the Irish change sides to fight for the little man. And, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, just you grow up with this shite. You really hope that at some point <laughs> in your life, you know, people just grow up and give up, you know. But no, th this, you know, these complicated reasons why people change sides. But it was all simplified, the notion of the, the fighting Irish, the lovable Irish. They only wanted to fight for Mexico. And, you know. I was at a football match where Ireland were playing Mexico, and the things that were being shouted at the Mexicans were not in any way fraternal, shall we say, you know? So, <laughs> and I didn't have a big speech to make or anything like that, but I just loved the idea of plonking two lads from the 21st century into the Battle of Buena Vista, and then, you know, this romantic notion that they're fighting for the little man would come, you know, so the, the, the casual racism of it all as well. What language is that? Packy. Oh, well, we must be in Iraq, you know. <laughs> So I just, I just did it for a laugh, really. Yeah. And uh, the research then was, uh, my research fellows who are 19 and 17 told me what smoke quadruple like. So I said, they're out of their heads. What would they be smoking? And I was told, uh, well, we know someone who knows somebody who knows somebody who. <laughs> <laughs> uh, triple X isn't good enough, apparently. And the hand gel thing was another story that um, uh, I thought it was fantastic, the hand gel. I didn't actually feel a burning need to drink it myself. <laughs> but it was one of the greatest rackets of last winter, I think you'll agree, you know, the, the hand gel everywhere. And you had to, oh, yeah. you know, every house and every little child was given hand gel. And you couldn't, you know, you couldn't actually wander around the kitchen without, you know, the hand gel. <laughs> and what I found really fantastic, in my innocence, it never dawned on me that it happened, was that their kids were drinking the hand gel. <laughs> and apparently it's good stuff. Maybe. So... Uh, <laughs> And, and, may, maybe and cocktails, cocktails, you know, coke and hand gel. And the mammies of Ireland, and I'm sure the UK and Scotland as well, were giving their kids, you know, the hand gel so they wouldn't die of, you know, whatever they, the, the, the flu, whichever flu it was. And there they were buying cokes on the way to school and putting in the hand gel and drinking this stuff to make maths and uh, religion and Irish and the rest of it more bearable. May, may, maybe it even keeps midges away, like that Avon product, Skin So Soft, which everybody uses in the Highlands. No, Perhaps it does. Do you drink um, that too? I don't know, they drink it. In the Highlands. I know what I'm doing with that. <laughs> After the chemist now. Anyway, the, the, the Doyle ear for dialogue is as sharp as ever. And oh, yeah, it's yeah, been yeah. absolutely great. Thank the, you. Um, we've got another just over 10 minutes to take some questions. I'm sure you have questions. We've got um, people with microphones. If you'd like to put your hand up, we'll send a microphone to you. You're all cowed into. Ah, no, you're not. There we are. Um, I heard your. I, I saw the play, um, the Playboy of the Western World, which you adapted, and I just. You probably have some cute anecdotes. Not really. From you writing that, you didn't. No, I, I co-wrote it with a Nigerian writer called B.C. Adigan. It was his idea. Uh, to you know, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the Playboy of the Western World, but this young man you know, the, uh, the very early 20th century he arrives in a village in west, the west of Ireland claiming he's killed his father and becomes something of a celebrity because of that. And BC's idea was that instead of it being uh, the early 20th century, it would be the early 21st century and the young man would be Nigerian. And uh, we decided to set it in West Dublin instead of uh, the west of Ireland. So it went from there. So uh, no real uh, stories to tell, no. Um, uh, about the writing, it was a, it was kind of a very the great. Uh, I'd never adapted some a, a previous piece of work before, but the really reassuring thing about it is that the plot is already there, which is great because one of the huge anxieties of setting out to write anything is the ending. I always encourage people just to start, go on, just start. But actually, you have to be aware that the ending is you know, and it's it's the one thing that would keep me awake more than anything else is how to find an ending, you know, how to bring it to an ending. But it was there for us already. So that was great, you know, the, the whole, if you like, the act one, two, and three, they were there for us. So, you know, that was less anxiety, but it was, uh, so we went through the original play and more or less kind of changed each line as we went along. 
There was one, funnily enough, what was really interesting I found was that all the religious re references, the, the original play is full of references to the saints and God and Jesus and Mary and their various manifestations. The Irish characters virtually always that dropped away. It's not in the vocabulary of these young characters anymore. And it, is in the it was in the lines of the two Nigerian characters, the young man and his father who appears later on. And the, it, if you like, the, gods, the go God is a living presence. He's up there watching. You know, and that was interesting that the religion was in the language of the uh, Nigerian characters, not the Irish ones. And the other one where we came across a word that basically had to be reacted to, I remember it was the word savage, that Christie in the play is referred to as a savage. And Christopher, the young Nigerian man, is referred to as a savage. And his reaction to the word savage had to be stronger than Christie's reaction in the original play because he, you know, this young Nigerian man couldn't let that go. That was like raw racism and he just, he, you know, he, so we, if you like, it's almost uh, this little uh, bump appeared in the play which hadn't been there before. But uh, it, was, it was like a, a day at the office in many ways, we'd go and we'd sit and we'd go through three pages and that was a good day's work and we'd meet again later in the week, we'd do the same thing. So it went very, very well. Uh, very, uh, the writing went very well. What happened afterwards is a different story, one I don't want to talk about too much, but uh, we, we, we no longer talk to each other, sadly. And he's a very angry man, but uh, that's a different story. And uh, I, I, I'd need a chart to describe what went on. But the writing of it was quite a, it was a fascinating thing. And it was an easy invitation to accept. Um, it was the first time I'd worked. I co-wrote the, the, the screenplay of The Commitments, but that was done, you know, I wrote a version and then Dick Clement and Dean Lafrenet, uh, who you'd be familiar with, who wrote, say, Porridge and uh, The Likely Lads, these great comedies from the 70s. They wrote a version on top of my version, but they were in Los Angeles and I was in Dublin, so we never actually sat around the table and worked in that way. So it was the first time I'd worked with somebody else, and that was kind of, it was, it was good, it was interesting, but at the same, a bit exhausting. I found myself uh, really tired, because I think when you're writing, you're having these rows with yourself all the time. I am anyway. I'm, I'm always having these little rows, arguments with myself about what works and what doesn't work. And then you're working with somebody else. So you're having the rows with yourself and him and his rows. So there's like a lot of, and they weren't, I'm not talking about shouting or roaring at each other, but these decisions became more complicated because they were decisions of two people rather than just the one. But it went very well. Uh, uh, the play itself was fantastic. I was really very, very happy with it. Do we have another? Yes. Gentleman, right here. Um, you mentioned about um, you're conscious of being Irish when you're away. How do you avoid being like an Irish ambassador and, as you say, having an answer, a stock answer for all of the sort of standard Irish questions? Well, I, I, the way to avoid it is to answer the questions honestly, <laughs> rather than give the answers that people might like to hear. Uh, so. It's a bit like, I remember my mother lost her mother. Her mother died when she was uh, three in 1928. And it was, a, you know, very sad. She knew very little about her, didn't know her name even. Nobody talked about her, uh, didn't know where she came from. Years and years later, she discovered letters. In her 50s, discovered letters that had been written from America by a family. The name that kept coming up was Beekman, which isn't Irish, it's Dutch. But she was telling somebody about this, and this was in the 70s, and they gave her, somebody gave her the phone book for uh, Manhattan, and she wrote to anybody called Beekman. And eventually she discovered she had first cousins living in Long Island, a whole load of first cousins living on Long Island, and they were absolutely delighted to discover that they had re living relatives in Ireland. They thought they, that was gone. And uh, they arrived in Ireland. I remember it clearly. I think I was about 19, 20, maybe 21. And it was fascinating because, you know, it's easy to sneer at the, uh, that the, the, the Americans arriving in a foreign country. But they were, it was really fascinating. And one of the things that they, they, they almost resented the fact, for example, that we had color, a color television <laughs> that was bigger than theirs. <laughs> and they expected a certain 
thing and it wasn't there. It was a kind of a modern city with all the, you know, with all the greatness and the ugliness that comes with that. And the problem with Ireland back then was that we tried to kowtow to the quiet man. Now that seems to be gone, although there's a pressure on to bring it back, but it won't happen. So I think the, the only way you can cope with being, you know, really temporarily Irish is just to give, you know, honest answers, not to give the answer that people might like or that the tourist board might like or that the current government or any bloody government might like, actually, you know, just give honest answers, you know, which in my case is quite easy. I, well, it, you know, and again, honesty is that, you know, as you go older, you're honest one day and you have a totally different answer the next day and you're being honest. <laughs> you just forgot to take the hand gel the day before. <laughs> but, you know, the honesty shifts and changes, so just avoid stock answers. If only to keep for your mental health, I, you know, when I'm, I, I, I haven't done one of these things in a while, uh, since the spring, but uh, there was a point where I began to hate the sound of my own voice because I found myself giving the exact same answers all the time. It's nothing to do with being Irish, it's just you'd end up, now you've, nobody's ever asked me that question before, your question. I might be lying though. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, it just, if only for one's mental health, it's nice to vary the answers a bit, you know. 